because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. Well, today we have just about the most appropriate guest in the world for the time because we are headed into COP26, the UN Climate Conference, plus we are in a world of skyrocketing uh, fuel prices. Recently on Twitter, I wrote a post, also posted on uh, energytalkingpoints.com, about the causes of the fuel crisis. And um, someone whom I'm generally a fan of and one of the world's leading climate economists uh, wrote, uh, let's just say that he did not agree or he thought there was a lot wrong with my claim. And so I thought that was really interesting. Uh, and this is someone I've wanted to talk to for a while. Anyway, his name is Richard Toll, again, one of the world's leading climate economists. So I asked him if he would come on the show and he graciously uh, agreed. So we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about his work, his research, and then talk about where we disagree and possibly agree on energy prices. So uh, Professor Richard Toll, welcome to Power Hour. Thanks for having me. Right. So you are known as one of the world's uh, leading climate economists. I would say that this is a pretty sophisticated audience that you have, but still I think it would be useful uh, for you to just quickly explain what is climate economics and what do climate economists do? Uh, climate economics is the economics of three things. Uh, it's the economics of climate change. It's the economics of climate policy. And it's the economics of climate. Uh, so the economics of climate is essentially the long-term development our poor countries poor because they're hot or if there's some other reason uh, that mostly explained by the poor. Uh, the economics of climate policy is mostly about what would it cost to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? How would you design policies to do so? How would you set up an international architecture uh, to guide that emission reduction internationally? Uh, and the economics um, of climate change is mostly uh, the impacts of climate change in terms of human welfare as well as adaptation to climate change. Now, interesting, this, this raises, I think, a question already that I was going to ask later, but occurs to me now, which is that there's, you know, there's a lot of criticism right now of climate economics. And as a pretty uh, kind of famous Bloomberg uh, econom uh, a columnist slash economist who wrote this article on how climate economics has failed. And his, I mean, he actually goes after you pretty strongly, and I don't think fairly, but he says his general point, which I'm most interested in your thought on is, he says the big conceptual mistake here is to assume that what are, whatever economists can easily measure is the sum total of what's important for the world. And I would add, they, they would just say, well, climate economics is ignoring all of this really important stuff, and that important stuff is justifying far more aggressive measures than you, Richard Toll, and others are telling us to take. Well, I have two responses to that. First, uh, what particularly Bill Nordhaus, but also me and a number of other people have been arguing is that climate policy should be more ambitious than it currently is. Now, I'm not talking about the rhetoric of climate policy, but what is actually uh, happening with greenhouse gas emission reduction, and that is not much, and it's definitely less uh, than we have called for for decades now. Uh, so that is my first response. Uh, the second response, um, these complaints that our impact estimates are incomplete have been around for a very long time. Um, and uh, Noah Smith is not at all original there. The, the, the main issue I have with these complaints is, yes, they're obviously true. Uh, climate change affects a great many things. Uh, I would say, almost say almost everything. Uh, but it affects a great many things. Uh, a number of these things have been quantified and monetized and are included uh, in our estimates. And a great number of other things have not been included. So the charge that we are incomplete is true. Our estimates uh, are incomplete. The implication that uh, Smith and others have drawn that therefore these are drastic underestimates I don't buy, uh, and there's there's two reasons for that. One is the presumption that climate change can only have negative effects, and that everything we have included must be negative. Uh, it's, it's just not, it's just a nonsense uh, statement. Uh, and the second thing is that the things that we have omitted must be large, and must be much larger than the things that we have omitted. And of course, throughout the history of the of research on the impacts of climate change. People have always started with those things that they thought were the most important ones. And by now we have a long list of 
50 or 60 impacts that have been studied. And the idea that the, the number 61 on that list is bigger than number one to 60 and that people over the last three decades, four decades have been pretty silly and forgot the most important thing, just doesn't add up. That's just, I mean, it could happen. Of course, we haven't studied it, so we haven't quantified it, so we don't know for sure. Uh, but a confident prediction that you have studied 61 thing, 60 things and the 63rd thing, uh, 61st thing on your list must be the most important and must be much bigger than the other 60. It's, it's just a very strange, a very strange concept. Well, so I think, so I was reading this article and, and your point that there's this assumption that everything is bad seems very pervasive in this article by Noah. Uh, in particular. So he has this sentence, first of all, climate change doesn't just warm everything up gently and evenly. It causes erratic weather, which can include very cold weather. This was widely understood well before Toll wrote his paper. And it's interesting to me that he jumps from it doesn't cause warming, let's just say evenly, which I think most climate scientists would say it doesn't. It tends to cause warming, I think, more in colder regions. But it's interesting that he treats the unevenness as all bad versus some people would say, oh, well, it's actually going to be good in, in colder regions or it'll be good at night or, or at least less bad or it'll be less bad in the winter. And so to me, that, that signifies he has this premise that human impact is necessarily bad. And that's the only explanation I can think of for why number 61 is assumed to be a catastrophe, just like we have all these catastrophe predictions for 50 years. And like by Ehrlich and others, they keep coming false, but everyone thinks, oh, the next one is right. And it seems to be that can only be explained by them thinking human impact is intrinsically bad. And also mother nature is going to punish us somehow. No, that, 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 that is indeed the underlying assumption. Actually, what, what he says there that climate change may also lead to cooling and that is could be pretty bad that is actually new information and it's, it's not on very solid ground uh because climate models i mean the reason that uh, you had these very cold episodes uh, particularly in north america had to do with the position of the uh jet stream and the impact of climate change on the jet stream is actually not very well understood we know the impact of the jet stream on the temperature in North America, but we don't mm -hmm. know the impact of climate change on the jet stream. So, so his implication that we've known this all along um, is, is just not true. Uh, what he is right about, uh, that these sort of events are actually uh, fairly costly uh, because, and, and that, that actually leads back to your, the, the other thing that he claims that climate change is necessarily bad actually cooling is probably worse than heating um and that has to do with the fact that i mean cold weather kills right kills a lot of people and there's actually one of the, the the positive impacts of climate change that we would have fewer cold deaths in winter and that we would have to spend uh, less money on heating our house for winter uh, if it is indeed true that because of climate change we could look at colder winters in north america because of the jet stream, uh, then the impacts of climate change would be much larger than we have currently assumed, because so far we have actually found that warmer winters are a good thing in North America. Yes, again, this seems to be a philosophical difference, not just between you and Noah, but between you and many people commenting on this, and I would say between me and many people, because you're looking at it as, oh, we could impact the earth in a way that was good, namely good for us. And I think the way most people view it is it's wrong for us to impact the earth. There's just something morally wrong about that. And then they expect that there are going to be bad consequences. I think it's very much like the religious idea of, you know, you sin, you do the wrong thing, and then you get punished by going to hell. Do you think most people commenting on this just think it's morally wrong for us to be impacting climate? No, absolutely. Um, and this, this goes back uh, a long time. Um, the, the reason that so many people believe this, I think goes back to Romanticism. Uh, romanticism, an old literary movement for those uh, who don't know this history. Uh, and it was essentially a response, a reaction to the Enlightenment, where the early people in the Enlightenment were fairly optimistic about technology and were trying to be fairly rational in their decision making. And the response in literary circles to all this optimism and particularly all this rationalism 
was sentimentalism and later romanticism, where people look back at the past, things were so much better before industry, uh, and we were all happily living in our villages in close-knit circles and everything was great. Uh, that is essentially the core idea of romanticism. And <clears throat> romanticism has three offsprings, two unsavory ones, communism and Nazism, <coughs> fascism. And the third one is environmentalism, where you see still that sentiment of the noble savage and things were better in the past and <clears throat> everything we do to planet Earth must be bad, right? Um, and the one who said this uh, best, and I realize I'm speaking to a, a United uh, States audience or a North American audience, uh, was Friedrich Schiele. Uh, was a, 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 a friend of uh, Goethe, the famous, um, <clears throat> and, and a friend of uh, Beethoven, the famous composer. And, and Schiller argued that uh, God has created the world, and he argued that uh, God is good, and therefore the world that God has given us must be the best of all possible worlds. And the implication of that is, of course, that anything you would do to this earth mm -hmm. is bad because you started in the best of all possible worlds. So any change we make to the natural order is bad. And that, that is a romantic idea. And you still see it very strongly in a lot of environment. Now, <clears throat> one of the great Enlightenment philosophers, John Hume, actually argued that this is just wrong. And I hope I'm not insulting any of your more religious uh, listeners. Um, and he called it the is old fallacy. And so you're talking about da David Hume, right? The Scottish philosopher. Da David, David, sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, and then later, uh, George Moore actually called it uh, the naturalist fallacy. And it's the same thing, right? Uh, it's essentially the idea that the way things are is the way things should be. And that then immediately implies that anything you do then is bad. And the, 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 it, it's a completely ridiculous argument. If you look back a uh, hundred years, education was pretty bad, right? A lot of people were illiterate. Uh, illiteracy is now, at least in the Western world, uh, almost absent. Women's rights were much worse, right? Uh, you would not want to be gay a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, and so on and so forth. All these things have, I would argue, drastically improved. Well, um, also environmental things like, sorry, also sorry, environmental yeah. things like air and water quality, mm -hmm. which are 10, we tend to think, oh, those were great in natural times. Which is true in some regards, but not necessarily in all regards, right? Uh, also the idea that uh, you and I don't know where you are, but you're far away, right? Uh, that yeah, you California. can just uh, talk over a computer is, I think, an improvement. And it's something that is unprecedented, right? And uh, that we have this technology, if you compare it to 200 years ago, this was definitely impossible, but uh, only 10 years ago, it was definitely much more difficult to do this with a uh, video link and so on and so forth. I think that these things are better now when they're definitely unprecedented. So the idea that any change is bad, just, doesn't add up, right? But, but doesn't it, if I think it depends on you, what standard you're evaluating things by, because if you're stand, if you're evaluating things by the standard of human well-being, yes, the earth in the world is overall much better. But if your standard is really unimpacted nature or wilderness, which it is for some people, the idea that the perfect earth is the one that would exist had we never existed, then it is true that today's world is bad precisely because we've impacted it so much. Oh, absolutely. Um, of course, in parts of the world, things are getting better in that respect as well, because we have become so good at agriculture. Actually, in North America and Europe, we're returning a lot of what right. used to be agricultural land to nature, uh, not true across the world. Um, if indeed your ideal world is the one, what it was like 8,000 years ago or 12,000 years ago, yes. Uh, then things are a lot worse. That's not the case if you reason from a human perspective. From a human perspective, things are a lot better yeah, than they were. Definitely. So um, 
One final question sort of about your background. I have lots more, so maybe if you like this, we'll talk again. But I'm curious about, because we have this Glasgow conference coming up, if you could briefly summarize how you became involved with the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and then also why you left a certain group in the IPCC. Um, I became involved uh, with the IPCC because my boss needed help. Um, my then boss um, was pretty high up in uh, international climate policy and one of the founders of the IPCC was a, a was invited to be an author uh, but didn't have the time to do it so he wrote me and I was pretty I think it was 23 or 24 when I first got involved with the IPCC. Uh, <clears throat> the IPCC works as follows that once you're in their address book you stay in their address book so <laughs> I guess they just keep asking the same people over and over again. Uh, so I stayed um, in there. I was involved in the second assessment report, in the third assessment report, uh, less so in the fourth assessment report, but again, pretty happily involved in the fifth assessment report, as well as in some of the intermediate reports. Um, I left, I did not leave the IPCC, but I left the uh, group that was writing the summary for policy, or drafting the summary for policymakers for the uh, working Group 2 for the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. Working Group 2 looks at the impacts uh, of climate change. And the reason for that was that I thought we had a pretty solid first draft um, with one new and I thought important conclusion, uh, also a snappy one. Uh, and that conclusion was that the largest impacts of climate change are really symptoms of underdevelopment and mismanagement. And for a snappy conclusion, you can even see a New York Times headline <laughs> uh, with those words. Um, but then, and it, it's not entirely a new conclusion, but by the time of the, and this was uh, 2014, at that time there was sufficient academic backing for that. There was sufficient literature that supported that conclusion, uh, we thought. Um, so I thought it important was important that that was one of the headline conclusions for the summary for policymakers. Uh, but then in the second draft, this was cut out and it was replaced by much more the standard doom and gloom, we're all going to die type of language uh, that you see uh, in much of the climate reporting. Uh, and at that point, um, I mean, anybody who knows my work knows that I don't think that. And that implies that you're not an author, right? You should not put your name to a piece that you would not have written. And, and, if, and it, it's not so much have you written it, right? But authorship means that you're responsible for the message, not that you put a word uh, to uh, because it's a large theme, right? So at that point, I withdrew. Um, and then seven or eight months later, I accidentally um, it slipped out of my mouth when I was talking to a journalist uh, that that is what I'd done. <laughs> and then the next uh, day, that was World News. Um, but the, the, the reason that I left was very simple. I do not agree with his message. I think it's, you put your name to it. I just want to, I want to stress that, you know, so summary for policymakers, that's one of the most consequential things in the world that's mm -hmm. written because, you know, the IPCC is supposed to synthesize the best, most current climate research, and then it does it in these multi-thousand page reports. And then the summary for policymakers is almost exclusively uh, what everyone reads. And so I just say that it's, 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 it's a little bit, I mean, more than a little bit scary to me how a few people or certain agendas can dramatically skew that because the message you are talking about is almost 180 degrees opposite to the message that came out then and certainly that's coming out today. Oh, abs absolutely. I mean, uh, the fifth assessment report was the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? Death, what? war, famine, pestilence. What's the sixth then? I, I, um, I, I have been busy, so I really do not know what the sixth assessment report will do. 
I, I mean, I mean the, the working group one report is out, and uh, the working group two report will come in February, and I believe the working group three in March or April. But I re I haven't looked at any draft, so I really can't tell you what is in there. So I looked at it a bit. I mean, it's interesting, like comparing some of working group five, or, or rather, not of working group five, of of AR five and AR six. There's definitely like some of the parts of AR5 that were used by people who are critical of catastrophism, not of climate change, but of climate catastrophism. Those are either stripped out or they're they're pared down. So you can find fewer things in working group one that are less catastrophist. So, which is what I expected. Absolutely. The message is much more positive. Um, I mean, I mean the, the thing that you should really worry about is the top end of the climate sensitivity, right? If mm -hmm. the climate sensitivity for the listeners unaware is how much the world would warm in equilibrium if the atmospheric concentration of CO2 would double, uh, those, the top end of those estimates have been pared down quite dramatically. And those are the scenarios that we should really worry about. Uh, another thing that working group one sort of set between the lines is that those very high emission scenarios are off the table. They're just not credible anymore. Uh, and that is another major change compared to AR5. So, uh, <laughs> and you would not notice from the newspaper reports, right? That all said, oh God, it's much worse than we uh, thought seven years ago. Actually, AR6, the sixth assessment report of the IPCC is much more optimistic or much less pessimistic than the fifth assessment report. Yeah, I'm curious once you read it all the way through, because I think that there's some element of that in terms of the content, but also just looking, I was mentioning AR5 versus AR6, some of the language about like attribution of things, talking about storms and drought, like it's, at least my interpretation is they're definitely trying to show more attribution and trying to make it seem more negative than they were um, before. But it'll be it'll be interesting to see. I, I definitely haven't read it all the way through, but I it... it <clears throat> My, my fear is that like people are very, I mean, I'm pretty negative on, I'm more negative on IPCC than people like even Bjorn Lomborg because my, like, I think the politics drives the synthesis a lot, the, the reports, not just the summaries uh, of the reports. And so my expectation is that it'll keep getting more catastrophist where it, where you can possibly do it. So yeah, if they have to lower the sensitivity estimates a little bit, they will, but I don't know, maybe you disagree with that, but that's, that's my sense of no, uh, I, I mean, uh, IPCC is a large organization and a complex organization, so and any generalization is wrong, uh, but you're definitely right that there's a lot of political influence uh, in the IPCC, uh, and that starts, that starts with the selection of authors, um, which is the job of governments, uh, and I do recall an episode when I was working in Germany where uh, only the friends uh, of the minister were sent to the IPCC and was a green minister at the time. And other countries have done very similar things or withhold support for certain people that they don't want in. Uh, so the selection of authors um, is one thing. Then there's group think within the IPCC because it's all very like-minded uh, people. Uh, another friend of mine from when I worked in Ireland got into the IPCC because he was interested in the topic. Uh, he's an electric engineer and he wanted to know how do you fit in renewables into a, a, a system and that, that is an intellectual challenge and that is why he was there. Uh, and then what he told me when he met all his co-authors in the IPCC, they were all there not because of their intellectual curiosity, but because they were basically activists, they wanted to change the world, right? So the selection of authors and then the author dynamics add a lot of politics to it. Uh, but then also, you rightly said, uh, there's a very, by now, a very large literature on climate change, and that is summarized in a fairly short report, but still thousands of pages long. Uh, but when I, when I uh, wrote the fifth assessment report, Given the page limits, we essentially had one sentence per paper, sort of how we summarized, right? Um, and that then, that report of thousands of pages then gets condensed to 10 pages or so in the summary for policymakers, maybe 20. And the filtering that takes place in that process. And then, of course, what is picked up by the media is actually not the summary for policymakers, 
but the presentation that is even shorter about the summary for policymakers. Uh, and then it's one headline in- Code Red for Humanity by Guterres is the <laughs> uh, headline this year. There is an enormous amount of politics uh, going on. There's also behind the scenes, a lot of positioning and posturing going on. Yeah, because getting that one headline that comes out of the IPCC is enormously good for your career. You can show, well, this particular headline is because of this paper I wrote, um, that indeed people are preparing and positioning papers so that they can be that headline. And of course, most of them fail, uh, but there's definitely a lot of politicking uh, going on that, yes, I, I want to be the headline, not you. Gotcha. All right. Well, this is a fascinating subject. We got to get into this, this post that I wrote that you disagree with. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to read it quickly, at least the essential parts, and then I will give you the floor. Uh, and then we'll see if I have anything to say in response. I'm really curious what you're going to say. Okay. So I'll just read what I, what I wrote, exact text. Uh, skyrocketing natural gas and coal prices are not a failure of the fossil fuel industry, but the total failure of anti-fossil fuel policies which falsely promised that if we dramatically restricted fossil fuel energy production, green energy could easily replace it. There is no physical reason why the natural gas and coal industries can't meet rising demand. The world has hundreds of years worth of gas deposits and thousands of years worth of coal deposits, but governments radically restrict the freedom to utilize those deposits. There is no technical or economic reason the natural gas and coal industries can't meet demand. These industries have gotten radically more capable and efficient in the last two decades, especially natural gas with fracking but governments radically restrict their freedom. There is no inherent logistical reason the natural gas and coal industries can't adapt to rising demand, except for the compounding problems created over the decades by draconian restrictions on export and import terminals, pipelines, and other infrastructure. We know that the US natural gas industry has an enormous untapped ability to produce natural gas, but that green policies to stop pipelines and LNG export facilities prevent it from using that ability with the promise that solar and wind can take over. In Europe, fracking and other shale gas technologies could produce a lot of gas, but Europeans have over and over chosen to ban fracking, reassuring citizens that solar and wind could provi would provide all the energy they need. How is that going? America has been called the Saudi Arabia of coal. At today's prices, America's coal industry would love to be powering the world, but it can't because of onerous restrictions on coal transport, as well as myriad domestic restrictions on desperately needed coal production. The pandemic recovery has provided the perfect test for the claim that solar and wind, after extensive mandates and trillions in subsidies, would make up for lost energy from fossil fuel restrictions. Skyrocketing coal and gas prices mean that solar and wind have failed uh, the test. And then I just go into what I think are the policy implications. But th those are the main economic uh, points. And so you you wrote that, I mean, essentially wrote that you did not think this reflected a good understanding of, of this issue. So we'd love to know your response. Um. <laughs> It was Twitter, right? So people are perhaps a bit harsher than they are when they're looking at somebody and uh, having a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, the thing that I disagree with most is the idea that the current crisis in energy, uh, in energy markets, has a lot to do with uh, climate policy. That that was my main uh, objection. And that you mean an inherent in, inherent in climate policy, or the the particular things that have been passed the, as the, climate the, policy? The particular things that are going on now. Uh, so the issues: why is uh, energy so fossil energy so expensive at the moment? Has everything to do with the fact that the economy is growing, is bouncing back from the pandemic much faster than most people anticipated. So demand for energy is rising much faster uh, than people had anticipated. And we simply have bottlenecks in, uh, in the supply of any form of energy. It's not just fossil energy, it's the same is true for renewables energy. It simply takes time to build up. Um, we, in, in economics, we have this thing called the pig cycle, where farmers respond to the prices for pork of last uh, year, and that means that you're always oscillating. Uh, if prices are high, supply next year goes up, so next year supply is down. Now, we call that a big cycle in economics, but really it better describes the oil cycle, because oil always goes through booms and busts, and that is because people start investing in increasing the supply when um, the prices are high, 
uh, but then it takes a couple of years for, to bring all that stuff on uh, online. And then by the time you're there, the demand is evaporated and the price collapses. And we've seen that time and time and time again in the um, in the energy market, in all energy markets. Um, so that is, I think, the prime reason why energy prices are so high. Demand for fuel has simply increased much faster than anybody dared dream uh, six or nine months ago. Um, so, so that is the main reason. There, there is one exception to that where climate policy really has an impact immediately on the energy market, and that is in China. Uh, so Xi Jinping has uh, sort of mandated fairly strict uh, CO2 emission limits. Um, lower officials in municipalities and provinces for the best way of meeting these targets is simply to close down coal-fired power plants. And as a result, there were major blackouts uh, in China. And a lot of industries had to shut down because they did not have any electricity. Uh, which partly explains all the uh, supply chain issues that we're having uh, across the world at the moment. Um, <clears throat> that has now been reversed. <laughs> they have realized that this was quite stupid, uh, quite a stupid thing to do, and those coal-fired power plants are reopening. And we see the same in other parts of the world, that in, in Europe, a lot of coal-fired power plants were closed, not so much because of climate policy, but much more because of acid rain policy. Uh, but they weren't decommissioned, they were simply mothballed. And at the moment, we actually see a number of them reopening to meet uh, the demand. Uh, in, in Europe, we have another big issue with gas. Uh, and that has to do, you mentioned shale uh, gas, but that is not the big issue at the moment. Um, it looks as if, Putin is holding back gas supplies to Europe in order to get Nord Stream 2 uh, approved. And the reason that he wants Nord Stream 2 uh, to be approved is because then he can choke off uh, Ukraine in particular and perhaps invade Ukraine. Uh, <clears throat> or invade more of Ukraine, I should say, uh, correctly. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of geopolitics they're going on. And, and the Europeans, we were stupid enough to run down our reserves, but not run them up again in summer. And I don't know who made that decision. Um, but that person or persons uh, should really be ashamed of themselves. And that explains why the gas prices are so high uh, in Europe at the moment. I, I, I don't follow the, the, the US gas markets uh, that closely. Um, <clears throat> The reason that uh, there is so little shale in Europe has not so much to do with climate policy, it has a little bit to do with climate policy, but it has much to do with uh, or the, the reason that the shale, uh, oil and shale gas in the United States, but not in Europe, has to do with A, Europe is much more densely populated, so those uh, the, those, those oil and gas fields would be much closer to people and therefore uh, more problematic. Uh, but probably more importantly, um, in the United States, the things that are underground are owned by the landowner. So if you own a farm and somebody come and prospect and find gas there, that gas is yours. So you have a good incentive to allow these people to drill for gas. In Europe, gas and oil on the ground is owned by the government. So if you're a farmer and they find oil under your field, you're in trouble because you won't get compensation, but you will get all the uh, bother of people drilling for oil on your land. Um, so that is the reason why oil and shale, uh, oil and gas shale never got off the ground in Europe. Uh, and that's very little to do with climate policy. Okay, so I think that, so here's where I definitely agree with you is that there are these kinds of cyclical things. So I'm not saying that without these policies, there would be no cycles, no boom and bust, that would obviously contradict history. What I'm saying 
I mean, my overall point is that these things are radically exacerbated. So the absolute skyrocketing in prices, the shortages, the things that could get far worse in the winter months, those I do not think uh, are are necessary. And and you're 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 putting it as climate policy. The way I think of it as green government controlled energy or green central planning. And in part, I, I, like climate policy is a little bit ambiguous. In part because people like you and Nordhaus are pretty big advocates of carbon taxes as ways to deal with things versus the way it actually works, which is government micromanaging all these different elements of everything. And I think it's precisely the way in which government pursues climate policy that makes things worse. Not that I'm in favor of a carbon tax, but it's infinitely worse than a carbon tax would be. And so if you look at, for example, like just talking to people. So if I talk to CEOs in the American coal industry or CEOs in the natural gas industry or CEOs in the pipeline industry, to a man, all of them will say like, yeah, we would love, we've been trying to produce more of this. We've been trying to move it internationally, but there are all sorts of domestic restrictions on this. There are all sorts of transportation restrictions. We can't do this. We saw prices months ago that we would have wanted. We don't need today's crazy prices. We saw prices months ago that we would have wanted internationally, and yet we are prohibited from doing it. And so my, my view is that if you run a thought experiment and you say there was no green climate-based central planning, so there were no restrictions on coal mining, natural gas drilling, except for safety type things, uh, transportation uh, domestically and internationally, if you didn't have any of these things, any of this central planning, then uh, including if China wasn't totally uh, dictatorially controlled. Um, but if you have, if, if there were truly a free market in energy, there would be not anywhere near this supply shock. And that's what I was trying to get at, that I think the variable that's making natural things far worse is this government restriction based on green central planning. The other thing I would say is I do think that green central planning tends to be based on a view that energy is not as important as climate. And I think that's filtered even to market expectations where I think people's expectations of demand were ridiculous. If you look at things that BP and others were saying about, yeah, we might be at peak oil, that was based on, I think, underestimating the value of energy in general and fossil fuels in particular. It seems crazy to say they're BP, but I think they're, that's definitely what's what's going on. So that's that's my view. Well, I, I, I would not go as far as calling green central planning, uh, but I definitely agree that there's a lot of poor regulation uh, of energy markets and poor design uh, of energy markets, and a lot could be and should be improved there. Uh, and that would avoid, would have avoided part of uh, the problems that, that we're currently seeing. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing um, that I want to raise is what you alluded to and what many people in the field call the energy trilemma. That what we would really like is energy that is cheap, that is reliable, and that is clean, that is sort of the holy grail of uh, the, the energy market. And uh, the problem is that it, it's easy to make cheap energy and it's easy to make reliable energy, but it's not harder to make cheap and reliable energy. And if you then have free goals, it also needs to be clean. It becomes almost impossible. Um, and what we're seeing at the moment is a very stark reminder that clean, our cheap and reliable energy is actually a great good. Now, it's of course seen in Louisiana that some people have been without electricity for weeks uh, on end, if uh, not longer because of the storms. Um, and definitely energy is no longer cheap in many parts um, of the world. Um, and you are right that because we have had relatively cheap energy for a while, people forgot what great good this is. Uh, and therefore, we could focus on making energy cleaner, forgetting about the potential cost implications. <clears throat> and, um, and this is just a stark reminder, very bad timing for COP26, that, yeah, <laughs> energy should be cheap uh, as well as clean, right? And it's very hard to do both at the same time and then also uh, keep it reliable. Well, let me just ask, so um, any, anything final you want to say? Because I think we got out our basic views of this, and at least people have some sense of where we agree, where we disagree, where we have different senses of the, the magnitude of different variables. Anything else you want to say? Because I just want to make sure I give you every opportunity to speak on this energy thing, because I have one final question about COP26. No, go ahead. So, you know, what do you expect 
from COP26 because it's this interesting thing. I, I never recommend strategically that they hold these things in the winter. I don't know why they do that. They should always do it when it's hot if they want to get people scared. And you've got like a fossil fuel shortage and it's cold and you have all these aggressive commitments. And then there's also this storyline that they've rejected nuclear, which is always an interesting facet of much of the climate catastrophe movement, how hostile to nuclear they are, even how hostile to large scale hydro they are. So like, what do you expect to come out of this conference, uh, good, bad, or neutral? Um, <laughs> predictions uh, should always be done carefully, definitely for some- Especially because we're gonna know in two it. weeks and people yeah, will see yeah, this yeah. forever. <laughs> <laughs> so if people will have fresh in their minds what I predict will happen, right? Uh, in two weeks time. And there, 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 there's a lot of dynamics going on, right? And in the background, there is the pandemic. And uh, cases are pretty high in the UK. Uh, and people are complaining that Xi Jinping are not, is not coming and that Vladimir Putin is not coming. But both are old and both are known to be scared of infection. Right? So mm. I think they're just afraid uh, of COVID-19. And that is the main reason that they're not coming. Didn't you call it a super spreader event? Yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be a, because the attitude of the UK government is that the pandemic is over against much evidence. Uh, they think that the pandemic is over, so they're not taking any any countermeasures. Uh, so, so so that is going on. Then we have, as we talked about, very high energy prices at the moment, and nobody is keen. No politician is keen on increasing energy prices further and that is of course what needs to happen if you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that means two things it means more expensive energy and more expensive food there's no two ways about it now we haven't talked about food yet but that, that is another implication um, and nobody is willing to say that at this moment because prices are going up across the world right uh, so, so they, they have themselves a problem then of course the and, and I, i'm based in the uk uh we have the host who is not really with the message and has been fairly incompetent and not prepared enough um but also the, the guy who is in charge alex sharma doesn't have a lot of power and the guy who's really in charge in, in charge boris johnson it's just a loose cannon. <clears throat> and what he said earlier this week is that one solution uh, to the problem would be that we start feeding people to the animals. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> he said, I didn't even see that. That's not the message <laughs> that you want to give. Um, and then in the same meeting, he completely messed up where uh, methane emissions are coming from. Uh, and of course, the budget that was released just earlier today in the UK shows that UK's climate policy is mostly greenwashing. There's very little substance uh, to it. Um, so that is going on. Uh, what you can expect also, um, and you may not have picked this up in North America, you have heard of Extinction Rebellion, right? Yeah, it's not as big it. here. And no, it's huge there. Here it's known, but most people would know what it is. There is now a new group uh, called Insulate Britain that really makes Extinction Rebellion look mild and sane. Um, in Slate Britain are completely and utterly nuts and completely out of control. Um, <laughs> and what they've done uh, today and over the last couple of weeks is just block major highways. Uh, they glue themselves to the road. And the major highway around London uh, is a main target, but they will disrupt uh, Glasgow. Uh, there's no doubt uh, about that. That is uh, on their horizon. <clears throat> so there's all these things uh, going on. Uh, we have the Pacific Islands already saying because of COVID, we can't travel and we will get a bad deal. So they have rejected whatever comes out of Glasgow before it has even started. Uh, we have Modi, uh, who is coming, uh, saying that he won't commit to net zero. Um, so it's going to be a big mess. And of course, we also have uh, John Kerry there, 77 years old. It's his last big chance to make, to, to build a legacy, right? 
uh, in climate policy. So he will be uh, try to be very aggressive, uh, but there's nobody who's going to follow him, I don't think. Well, in the U.S., you know, they've been failing with their, at least so far, with what they call their, you know, reconciliation bill. So they, they absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so the domestic climate, domestic climate policy in the U.S. is not going anywhere at the moment. Um, so they hope for an international breakthrough, but that's not got to come. Not from this. Uh, but I mean, Kerry is getting desperate, right? Um, so I think that the best outcome we can hope for from Glasgow is that it just descends into irrelevance and there's logistical issues as well. So it may be like Copenhagen, uh, a pretty bad experience for the people who are there, but it may also turn into a big dust up that people will fall out like they did in Copenhagen or worse. Um, and that as a result, uh, we all uh, not have much climate negotiations for the next five years. That is definitely a possibility. I, I don't see, um, if you reason from an environmental perspective, I don't see anything good coming out of um, Glasgow or I, from any perspective, I don't see anything good coming out of Glasgow. The other I thing that's really irrelevant. The other thing that struck me as, as interesting and maybe relevant in the cultural discussion is just the group of poor developing countries getting together and saying we shouldn't commit to net zero by 2050. That's a that that's going against Paris. And where's our hundred billion dollars a year in climate mm -hmm. aid? And you guys should go net zero by 2030. Like that to me was very interest. That that statement by those countries was very interesting. And uh, I'll be yeah, interested no, to see how uh, that, uh, that demand will definitely things. be there. It, we may actually. I mean, there's a reasonable chance that we get to the hundred billion. Of course, most of that is not new money, right? And a lot of that is fake money. Um, but we may well get to a plaza of 100 billion. Um, that is not something that I think will fail. But uh, other than that, as I said, the, the best case scenario for me, for Glasgow, is that it will just be irrelevant. And the worst case is that it will just be a big fight. Interesting. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Richard. Where can people Sorry. learn more about your work? Sorry? Where can people learn more about your work and follow your work? I know a lot of it is in academic journals, but you also write on Twitter. And I just I like to refer people to the guests. And uh, You can definitely follow me on Twitter, where I go by my own name, Richard Toll with one L. Uh, if you Google me, uh, you will find uh, several pages that collect uh, my writings. Uh, ID's Webpack is probably the best source for that. Do you still have a blog? I've read a couple of your blogs on IPCC stuff, but I don't know if that's still I, alive. I, the, the blog is still there, but most of the entries are fairly old. I, I, at the moment, do not have the time and energy to blog as well as all the other things that I do. Gotcha. So follow him on Twitter, and then you can see if, if he and I ever get into it on Twitter again. But uh, hopefully, if we do next mm -hmm. time, you'll be as gracious and come on the show. I really enjoyed this, and I'm, I'm really grateful to you for engaging with somebody on a disagreement instead of just fighting randomly like most people do. I mean, um, if you say something, then you should back it up, right? Um, so, <laughs> uh, agreed. I, uh, well, if I did not want to get into a discussion with you, I should not have started one. <laughs> well, hopefully, you don't regret it too much. All right. Thanks so much, Richard. Okay. Take care. Thanks again to Richard Toll for joining me. For those of you watching on YouTube, uh, you can no longer see me because I left for a trip uh, right after the interview with Toll. So, I am recording this on my iPhone. Uh, just a comment or two about the discussion. First of all, as I said during the interview, I'm really in discussion uh, and somewhat debate. Uh, I'm glad that he came on the show, and I think that's that's good conduct that is not normally exhibited by many people who disagree on these issues, particularly catastrophists. But that feeds into my next point, which is that obviously Toll and I agree on a lot, maybe more than he thought we would agree on, in advance, and in a sense, more than I thought we would agree on it in advance, in that I did not know how explicitly he, uh, explicitly aware he is of the different kinds of philosophical issues involved. 
and how where he is that that his humanistic perspective perspective rather makes him distinctive. A uh, comment about the philosophy this came up very quickly. He was talking about you know naturalistic fallacy or natural fallacy. I think is is the better term. I forget which one he used, but the idea that something is good because it's natural, and then he related this to. Uh, David Hume's is ought dichotomy, which is the idea that you cannot go logically from what is from facts to what ought to be uh, to values. And, and I don't think that's the same issue at all. And I completely disagree with the is ought dichotomy. Um, as a devotee of Ayn Rand, I think she has a definitive refutation of it. And the basic idea in my understanding is just that the whole idea, the whole rational basis of ought and values, and there, there is one, is the factual requirements of what human beings need to survive and flourish. So, you know, what are there facts about, you know, what is in terms of energy that imply what we ought to do? I think, yes. I mean, in terms of, you know, in terms of specifics, now there's a counter to this, so I'll go, get to the more fundamental thing, but you know, in terms of the specifics, that, you know, the fact that cost-effective energy uh, is essential to human flourishing that means that we ought to do it. And then there's this question of, okay, but wh- how can you say that we ought to do, you know, we ought to pursue human flourishing? And the idea is that that, that it's, it's kind of the wrong way of thinking of it because human flourishing is the whole basis of ought. And the, at least the whole, and, and it's the, certainly the whole secular basis of it. So for more on this issue, you can read or familiarize yourself with the objectivist literature on ethics, particularly the Ayn Rand uh, essay, The Objectivist Ethics, which is probably available um, online. But I just wanted to separate those issues because uh, definitely I do not want at least me to be misunderstood as thinking that believing that something is good because it's natural, which really means because it wasn't impacted by humans, that that's, that's the same kind of fallacy as believing that you can go from facts to values, because I, I definitely think you can go from facts to values. And then just one final thing on the, the energy discussion, just to reiterate, I find the most helpful thing in terms of identifying what are really the dominant causes today to really just ask, if we had freedom of production, transport, trade in fossil fuels, so coal, oil, natural gas, if we were really free to produce and trade and transport them, would anything like today happen? Um, in terms of just prices quintupling, um, you know, companies going out of business, and I say no. Of course, there are going to be fluctuations. There are going to be some sort of unanticipated things, although, as I said, the less you value energy, the less you value the unique value of fossil fuels, the more you're not going to anticipate increases in demand. I mean, you even had BP talking about, oh, maybe we've already peaked in oil. This this references my last Power Hour, by the way, the last one I posted with Michael Lynch, which I invite you to listen to. So I think he, he certainly had, um, at least implied by what he said, higher expectations of demand than other people um, had. But But the core thing is that with freedom of production, transport, trade, uh, there is no way to have the failures where people are worried about, can we keep warm in the winter, where it no longer becomes economic to run factories. That has to be, the, the first level of looking at something like that is that has to be government interference, unless you know about some kind of absolute physical limit that we've reached, which is nowhere near the case in fossil fuels. And even there, if you had a free market, you have every reason to think that you'd be aware of that limit and you would have found substitutes uh, earlier. So just the, the first layer when you see, so my view is whenever you see these kinds of failures in a market, economists often talk about market failure and the, the premise is, well, when people are free, it leads to all these sorts of failures. But it's really it's really government failure that's the thing to watch out for. So when when you see a market or seeming market be radically dysfunctional or inept, you can be sure that government interference with the abilities and interactions of billions of smart people 
who left to their own devices could accomplish a lot, that that is to blame. And then in the context of energy, the obvious thing is interference in fossil fuel production. But there are other things in terms of interference with nuclear and also the mandating of unreliable wind and solar, which creates all kinds of different fluctuations in need for things because sometimes it's windy and sometimes it's not. And then if you're depending on hydro more than you should, then that creates other things because you're more vulnerable to drought. And the wind thing that I just mentioned is a, or the lack of wind is a very important thing. I mean, that's that's clearly happened in, in Europe at different points. So yeah, I, I remain totally convinced of my view. And I just think it integrates with Toll's view by saying, yes, he's he's identifying real dynamics, but it's very implausible that those dynamics can explain the complete ineptitude of the global uh, markets. That said, let's wrap up this episode. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, email me at alex at alexepstein.com. Make sure to subscribe to the free Energy Talking Points newsletter at alexepstein.substack.com. You'll get lots and lots of stuff, uh, good stuff that you can use and that you can share with others and so much going on right now, including you can get the talking points that originally led uh, Richard Toll to um, make some critical comments that led, I think, to this very constructive conversation. And you'll see all the references uh, of my talking points if you go to alexepstein.substack.com. Dot com, or you can also find them at energytalkingpoints.com, which I, energytalkingpoints.com, sorry for my inept pronunciation, where you can search for basically any topic and find powerful, concise, true, well referenced talking points. Uh, if you like the work that I am doing and the rest of the Center for Industrial Progress is doing, you can help support it by becoming an accelerator. Just go to industrialprogress.com slash accelerate. Um, I'm not sure who the next guest is going to be. There are some exciting potential ones in the pipeline. Uh, so I, I can only promise that the next Power Hour will be really good, just like this one was. Well, it, it'll be good just like quality-wise. It'll, qual- it'll probably be quite different in character. So hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll be back in two weeks or less. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.